that was completed in 2009. And, and it took a little bit longer to really get it back into operation from the astronomical side. So it got new instruments and new receivers and things like that. So uh, as of 2011, we were able again to uh, operate the instrument. This is an overview of the campus. Um, in the foreground, you see the 25 meter telescope. Um, there is a second dish, which can be seen in the background, which is a 10 meter dish. Uh, in this talk, I will primarily talk about the 25 meter dish, but let me briefly give you a short overview of all of the instruments. So you have a little bit of the idea of what this radio observatory is all about. Um, so the 25 meter dish itself, it's a prime focus instrument operated uh, in L band in two regions. One is the uh, 1280 to 1430 megahertz range. And then the OH uh, region of 1600 and We are presently preparing to expand the um, instrument to also operate in the UHF range in 400 to 800 megahertz. It remains to be seen though, how much of that spectrum is actually usable due to RFI, but we'll see in the next couple of months, I guess. Uh, quickly on the other dishes, the second uh, instrument is a 10 meter dish. It's um, not very well to be seen because it's in the shadow, uh, but it is an equatorial mount. And we use it for 12 and 23 gigahertz. That's the region where we find the methanol and the water mazes. So that's number th two in the terms of size. Going down one more in size is a three meter dish, which is basically used for educational purposes, also for some experimentation. It's an L-band um, device and it's mostly used for hydrogen observations. Um, there's some capabilities for this to use it also for uh, hydroxyl masers, some continuum observations, and we were also able to observe the strongest pulsar with this dish. So this is uh, a three meter device. Our smallest guy, this is this one, it's a 1.2 meter prime focus dish again. It's mounted on a trailer. And the purpose of that instrument is that we bring it to school so we can make radio astronomy experiments uh, at schools. So we move it right there. It's uh, designed to observe in the 14, 20 megahertz range for hydrogen line observations. So this is uh, essentially our school project a telescope. It's fully steerable as well. So it has a rotor here, but uh, of course, uh, it's only capable really to do hydrogen things. And to fit I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I muted inadvertently. Um, Rich, uh, where did I stop uh, getting my sound through? Um, go back to the last uh, slide. Uh, about, okay. Uh, look, yeah. Just to the end of that. Okay. I had my finger at the, at the wrong place, I guess. <laughs> All right. So this is a, a 1.2 meter dish. It's um, intended for school projects. So we haul it around. We can bring it to schools and it's uh, used for hydrogen line observations. It's a also a fully steerable uh, telescope, which is has its rotor there. Okay, going back to this slide again, um, the gray dish in the middle, that's the only dish we have which we don't use for radio astronomy. It's uh, actually a TV reception dish, but the other two are um, 10 meters apart. They form an interferometer. It's uh, two times 1.25 meter, and it's a meridian transit instrument. And uh, the purpose of that is to use it for 12 gigahertz, and we do continuum observations for that. So this is just a quick overview of the various instruments that we have. But today I really would like to concentrate on this one, on the big one. And um, let's jointly go inside and have a look at uh, how it's looking in the inside. I first wanna show this drawing. This is a drawing from the time when it was built, a cross-section drawing. Um, so there are very several stories and I'll sort of walk through that a bit to tell you where the main parts are. We start in the basement uh, down here. And there are a couple of things there. 
uh, but the main things are generators which uh, provide the DC power which we need. We have DC motors to control the instrument and the DC current, uh, the DC power is uh, provided by two generators which are shown on this picture. The other main piece that we have in the basement is IT equipment, um, basically because the basement is cooler so we don't have to worry too much about the temperature there. Uh, it's uh, essentially a lot of storage systems there, uh, telephone systems and so on. One story up in the ground floor, uh, we have a conference room or a presentation room um, where we can host about or seat about 35 people. And maybe it's worthwhile mentioning the lady that gives a presentation there right now, that's Zuke Britz and she's a member of the Event Horizon uh, Telescope team. So she was given a presentation there. And um, then we have a, an exhibition room where we have some of the uh, instruments from the history. So some old equipment, which we show to visitors. One more up, uh, that's me sitting at the controls of the instrument. Um, that's our con present control room where we, from which uh, we control the instrument and where we also have a lot of the equipment which, will, I, sh which I will share later on. The blue colored part, this is the moving part of the telescope. That's about 90 tons. And uh, you can see it's an azimuth over elevation construction and the azimuth drive is located up here. There is the motor that uh, drives it and then there are all sorts of gears in between and it all ends up at this big cogwheel that is about three meter in diameter. And the whole construction resides on a big ball bearing at the top of the building. Um, this picture is actually an artist's impression, it's not a real photo. Uh, because you can't really see inside, uh, but this is where everything resides upon. The elevation drive, um, that's again the motor here. Some gears, oops, that's one too early. That's uh, another gearbox and then to the other side of the gearbox there are even more gear parts uh, so that we then can move the dish up and down. The dish mechanically, it can move from minus two degrees up to 90 degrees. We have restricted that a bit to plus two degrees and 89 degrees for safety reasons. Um, but essentially we can really cover uh, the whole sky that's visible from our location. Now you have to move the instrument in a controlled way. So you have to have some controlling equipment. And um, we have a two layer system there. Um, Earlier today, we have heard from Charles Osborne that it's important to have good safety measures and especially that's true when you move 90 tons. So we have an SPC for all the things that have to do with safety. That's the brakes, the uh, monitor, monitoring the motors, uh, releasing the clutches and so on. That's the system. And on top of that, um, there is a standard computer that represents a control loop and that also does all the con uh, coordinate conversion between the different coordinates. This computer is connected to high resolution angular encoders, which are directly on the axis so that we get very precise reading of the actual position of the telescope. And with this, we can track objects, we can scan objects in various uh, coordinates. It could be equatorial coordinates, it could be galactic coordinates. We can also use directly azimuth and elevation. And we can also use two-line elements. Uh, two-line elements is a, essentially as the word says, it's two lines of information which describe orbital parameters, um, which are typically used for satellites, but you, we use it for comets. If we want to track comets, we can use two-line elements. What we do achieve is um, an accuracy for pointing and tracking of 0.05 degrees. So whenever we put into any point in the sky, we hit it by this number. So it's relatively precise um, and certainly well enough for our purposes. Okay, so much for the motion of the telescope. Now to the reception side, this is a view of our receiver. It is a 
cylindrical wave guide and it has a chaparral arrangement. So it's a multiple ring structure and um, the receiver itself, the inside is designed to operate in two linear polarization uh, directions. I mentioned it's uh, designed to work in L-band um, in these two frequency ranges and the receiver does a down conversion to an IF of 100 to 200 megahertz. So we can choose any bandwidth of 100 megahertz within these ranges and we bring down from the prime focus the IF. A block diagram of that. Good question. Yes, please. Uh, I got it from the chat from Don. Um, there was a German telescope used by the AMSAT DL to receive signals from Voyager. Could this be the instrument that received the Voyager signal? No, no, that's a different one. Um, I think that what he's talking about is a 20 meter um, unit that was that's in the city of Bochum, which is about maybe 80 kilometers north from where we are. Um, that's pretty much decommissioned uh, these days. So th this instrument here is um, essentially basically an astronomy device. So it's a okay. different one. All right. And, for, and from Gary Evans, uh, does the telescope have more than one angular encoder on each axis to cover possible encoder failure? No, just one. We, okay. we have just one encoder. Um, of course, um, it's addressing the safety question. So if we have any failure somewhere, there's a triple uh, safety measure, which um, when it, these are mechanical switches, which uh, limit the speed if we get to the uh, closer to the limits of the telescope, which stop the telescope. And if everything fails, we cut power with the third switch. So things have to go really bad if we get an accident. Okay, back to the receiver. Um, it's a conventional design, a heterodyne design. We have no, um, an LNA with a noise figure, a little bit better than 0.5 dB. Then um, there are obviously bandpass filters to filter out the region of interest. And then there is a mixer. Uh, LO signal is coming in, splitting between the two polarizations, converting down, and then there's a low pass filter and a bandpass filter. So very conventional uh, IF uh, thing. So we come down with two signals, IF, 100 to 200 megahertz, and now we need to make something out of that uh, to look what do we have inside the signal. And um, we have several backends that do that. The first, oh, one step back. Um, a few more slides on, on the inside of uh, the receiver. Uh, this is the looking into the receiver box. This is the rear end of the um, feed horn, the two uh, outputs coming to a low noise amplifier and then it goes on to the IF boxes where we do the IF conversion. Um, a few more things to look at. This is the inside of the horn so it's a cross dipole to pick up the two polarizations and this is a look inside of the IF conversion box so it has an input of the RF chain here. There are some filters on the other side and this is the IF amplifier section, and this is where the local oscillator comes in. All right, on the uh, onto the backends. Um, one backend does total power, which means it measures essentially the power received. And the typical way to do that is to have a square law detector, which measures the power or has a voltage that is proportional to the received power. And then we have a little bit unusual um, A to D conversion. The um, voltage that is proportional to the received power goes onto VF to, onto a VF converter. So we get a frequency that is proportional to the received power. And then there is essentially a frequency counter. Um, the advantage of that is that we can easily change the integration times by selecting the time, how long do we uh, measure the frequency. And that device has a network interface. So we get connection to the computer here. Really our main instrument, our main backend is this guy here. That's a spectrometer, which is based on an FPGA. It has been designed by the Max Planck Institute for radio astronomy. It's the same device that's also used in Effelsberg. That's also used at various other telescopes. And essentially um, this takes in the 100 to 200 megahertz IF signal 
And then we have two operating modes. One is called Advanced Fast Fourier Transform Spectrometer, where we have 16,000, roughly 16,000 spectral channels from these 100 megahertz. So we are talking about a couple of uh, kilohertz bandwidth for each channel. And we get a spectrum every second. So it has a one second time resolution. And we use that for the typical thing when we want to use hydrogen lines or some other spectral features. Then um, the second mode of operation is uh, called Pulsar Fast Fourier Transform Spectrometer. It's just a different load into the FPGA. And in this case, the number of spectral channels is much less. So the spectral resolution is not that good, but we can go down to 54 microseconds in time resolution. Obviously, if you want to observe pulsars, you have to have a high time resolution. So this is really um, the instrument where we do most of our work. Uh, let's look a little bit into the future, what we are working on right now. This is uh, our next uh, generation spectrometer or digitizer. It's called Iceboard. It was designed by the McGill University in Canada. And that will give us 16 channels of 800 megahertz bandwidth each. So quite a bit of bandwidth. And uh, obviously then we have a very high data rate. Uh, this device has multiple 10 gigabit interfaces to spit out the data to the computers. Um, this is still work in progress. So we are still working on that to get the software um, working and get everything lined up. And we're hoping to use that in the future for uh, Pulsar work and, and some other stuff. But then we also use some of the, let's say lower end equipment, um, software defined radios. This is a collection of software defined radios that we have some experience with. Um, some of these have already been mentioned. It's the Lime SDR. Uh, the other in Pluto, uh, which we use a lot, and some of the other things. Um, mostly we use these uh, SDRs on the other smaller telescopes, but sometimes for special purposes, we also use SDRs at the 25 meter dish. Okay, um, one of the important thing that was also mentioned in the previous talk is clock and times. So you need to have exact times. And the way that is set up at our observatory is we have a master rubidium clock, which delivers our 10 megahertz. And since we have several buildings, um, that signal is transferred or brought over to another building so that we have synchronous signals or syn synchronous clocks between the two buildings. And that means synchronous but also between all telescopes. Now the rubidium does not give us absolute time and absolute time is coming from a GPS that has two outputs. Uh, one is an RB signal, which is understood by many of our equipment. And another one is a pulse per second, which is coming from this GPS. And the GPS is also a backup 10 megahertz, just in case the rubidium fails. And this uh, GPS also delivers time to our network where we synchronize all our computers via NTP. Since the other building doesn't have the IRIG B, uh, we bring it not over. We have another GPS that provides IRIG B and pulse per second for the equipment that's located there. And finally, there's just as a backup, uh, there's a small Raspberry Pi with a GPS as a secondary NTP. So we take a lot of care that every time um, and under all circumstances, we have exact times and we have exact clocks. This is again a view um, how things are arranged in our control room, um, the equipment that I've just talked about. So there's one rack which has the uh, IF distribution essentially. So we come in with the two uh, signals and they are uh, post amplified and then distributed uh, so that we can connect several backends at the same time. So here's our total power backend that I talked about. These are two monitoring devices, a spectrum analyzer where we can just check whether everything is working and there's a monitoring receiver just in case we want to look at a specific frequency. And on top of here, we have this spectrometer that I talked about. On this, in this rack, there's another RF distribution and this is our rubidium clock. It's a pretty old device, old Hewitt Packard thing, but still working fine. Um, the clock's distribution is located here. So everything that needs 10 megahertz 
is connected here. And then we have some uh, equipment here, which has to do with a calibration signal injection. So we control calibration signals from here. This is the local oscillator for our L-band equipment. So we bring the signal up to the prime focus via a cable. This is just a test signal generator. And these two boxes here are the new backends, uh, the IC board digitizer and the corresponding computer, which has a high-speed interface to this digitizer. Again, this is work in progress and uh, we're not using it for observations yet. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll be ready to see our first astronomical signal with that. All right, um, just a few words, uh, not too much about the IT hardware, um, simply because there's so many things around, it doesn't make sense to go through all of that. Um, there's a gigabit ethernet uh, on the campus with a number of managed switches. And I just want to mention um, three, th three pieces of our IT equipment. Um, there's a high performance computer, which we use for the heavy num number crunching stuff. And the main thing is that this computer has a GPU. It's an NVIDIA GTX 1080. So uh, anything that needs uh, heavy parallel processing that is done on the GPU. Then for our new uh, backend, we need to have a very high data rate. So there's one computer which has um, eight times 10 gigabit interfaces so that we can actually absorb the data that's coming out of the new digitizer. And as we are collecting quite a lot of data and uh, we try to keep as much as possible of that, we have uh, five storage systems. Uh, and the total capacity is 180 terabyte. So it's um, hopefully lasting for the next period of time and we don't have to throw away data too much. To finish off um, the description of uh, the setup of the 25 meter dish, a few words about the software that we are using. The general principle is we don't want to reinvent the wheel, uh, try to use as much as possible um, that is available, but sometimes you have to do it your own. Um, the first thing is the control system. So all the software that controls the telescope, um, controls the position and so on. That's homebrew, that's Python based, uh, but of course we make use of existing modules, especially uh, for the coordinate conversion. You don't have to design that yourself. That's available. We use PyFM and some older um, modules, PyTPM. These do the coordinate conversions for us. To collect the spectra from our spectrometer, that's also some uh, high Python based uh, stuff that uh, we have written ourselves. But when it comes to recording spectra from software defined radios, we use again something that's available from the community. It's called SOPI SDR that control the software defined radios. And SOPI power is when we use uh, it for spectral observations, then this does the for fast Fourier transform. And we have just added a bit um, of software so that our data files contain all the information that come along with the position of the telescope, the time when it was recorded and so on. Um, as Stephen has pointed out that's important to have all that. And obviously that's what we try to do as much as possible. Uh, continue observation, that's also our own software. But when it comes to evaluation, Again, we rely on um, software that's available. We uh, use CLASS, which is from French astronomers for spectral line analysis. For the uh, pulsar recording, we use something from the Max Planck Institute. And then for the evaluation of uh, pulsar data, um, we use Presto, which has been mentioned just uh, before, and some other uh, general available pulsar programs for the different pieces of the analysis. A little bit of special is Heimdall. Um, that's from the Australian astronomers. That's the GPU accelerated pipeline. This is using the GPU. Um, this is when we do the heavy number crunching for fast radio bursts. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, later to explain why we use the GPU there. 
And then as part of our uh, new project with a new digitizer, we will use Kotekan from the Toronto University. Again, that's work in progress. We're just trying to learn and understand how to use it and uh, how to uh, implement everything uh, to get it into operation. So this is the suite of software that we use, the main parts um, and uh, well, with Kotekan, we hope to get it working soon. All right, so this is a brief overview of the dish itself with its different aspects. Um, so the question then comes, what do we do with all this? Lots of stuff, lots of equipment. So what are we doing? This is a sort of overview of what we call our observation areas. And I've organized that a bit um, and quickly want to go through that. Um, there are two parts, one is spectral observations and the other one is con continuum observations. On the spectral observation, we can also divide it into everything that has to do with hydrogen and everything that is not hydrogen. And um, the starting point obviously is the 21 centimeter line from our Milky Way. That's the classical thing in radio astronomy to be observed and this obviously uh, is something that many of you are doing as well. You don't need a 25 meter dish for that but of course you can do a lot of things uh, also there. There's an interesting aspect um, of this emission uh, which is called high velocity clouds. There are some places in the uh, Milky Way and also a bit outside of the Milky Way where you find emission at much higher velocities than you would normally find. And these are called high velocity clouds. The origin of these clouds, it's a little bit debated what that is, but it's interesting to see that there all of a sudden there's something coming in, falling into our galaxy at relatively high speed. And I think it's worthwhile mentioning that this is not something where you need a 25 meter dish. We have seen high velocity clouds, the stronger ones also with a three meter dish. So it's really worthwhile looking out for them. Then <clears throat> the opposite to the emission of the hydrogen is that you can observe, observe absorption. These are places where there's a continuum source and the radiation from this continuum source is absorbed by some hydrogen between the continuum source and yourself. That is actually something where you need a bigger dish. Um, so a three meter dish will not show that. And the next one is <clears throat> a little bit of my, my favorite um, in the hydrogen observation. It's called hydrogen recombination lines. Uh, a few words of what, what are recombination lines. This occurs in star forming regions where you ha have a high intensity of ultraviolet radiation, which then uh, ionizes the hydrogen and hydrogen then recombines so the electron gets captured again by the proton and then very highly excited atoms can occur and these atoms have transitions um, between their layers which again are in the radio regime and these can be observed and um, the interesting part of that is that a lot of the physical uh, conditions in these star forming regions can be derived from the measurement of these high um, recombination lines. The final part is um, extragalactic hydrogen. Obviously not only our galaxy emits hydrogen, but also other galaxies. And there are some interesting things to be seen. The other um, things that we observe is hydro hydroxyl masers uh, and also again, absorption of, hyd of uh, hydroxyl. Similar thing to the hydrogen absorption. Also, we, you can see that in OH. And also not only hydrogen can be observed in recombination lines, also carbon can be observed. And just to finish off the, uh, for the sake of completeness, um, the spectral observations that we do is methanol mazes and water mazes, but that is done with the 10 meter dish. Going over to the other side, continuum observations, that means uh, objects that emit in a broad spectral range. The typical objects are supernova remnants like Cassiopeia A, H2 regions, star forming, star forming regions, or active galactic nuclei. The, the strongest one there is uh, Cygnus A, but then there are many of 
uh, those other galaxies that we can observe by their continuum radiation. Typically, um, when we have visitors, they say, uh, what is the most distant object that you observe? And our answer is it's one of these here. And that's a uh, little bit less than uh, 10 million light years away, uh, 10 billion light years away. It's uh, 10 billion co-moving distance. That's our furthest object that we see. But much more interesting are the dynamic things. Um, pulsars uh, have already been mentioned today. Magnetars, which is a variant of pulsars and something which, um, and a phenomenon which is of triggering a lot of interest at the moment in the radio astronomy community, fast radio burst. I'll explain a little bit more about that later. And then there's a sort of a nice and funny thing which also was mentioned in the previous talk, lunar occultations. This is when a object like a supernova remnant or anything else like a galactic nuclear disappears behind the moon, then you can see how it disappears and how it reappears. So that uh, has been a fun observation this year and also last year. Now I can't go through all that in detail. So I have selected uh, oops, I've selected some of these uh, to deal with, with um, in a little bit more detail. And uh, let me start with a sort of funny thing uh, on extragalactic hydrogen. There is a radio galaxy, Perseus A, a uh, which is a Cypher 2 galaxy about 71 million parsecs away from us. It has a redshift of about 5,000 kilometers per second and has a flux of 13 Jansky. Um, so it's about 1% of what you would get from Cassiopeia. This is a continuum source. So it uh, emits over all the spectrum, uh, over a wide spectral range. But if you look in detail at the spectrum, you find that all of a sudden there's a frequency missing. There's a drop in the spectrum and uh, there must be something that takes that energy out. And the funny thing is that while the galaxy is moving away from us with about eight, uh, without about 5,000 kilometers per hour, this one is moving with more than 8,000 uh, kilometer per hour. So how does that come? How does that appear? And the mystery is, can be solved as such. You have the radio galaxy Perseus A, this is an optical picture of it just for demonstration purposes. And this emits a, in a broad spectral range in the radio regime and we receive that. Now, in between the radio galaxy and, and ourselves, there is a cloud of hydrogen, which you don't see otherwise. And this absorbs this hydrogen, this hydrogen line. And the reason why that's moving so fast away from us, faster than Perseus R, the reason for that is simply, it is close to Perseus R and is gravitationally attracted by Perseus A. So it's falling onto Perseus A and you can see that. So this is sort of a yeah, nice experiment. It's not something that we have detected. It's known from the literature, but it's really nice to, to observe that. Second observation example, um, are OH mesas, hydroxyl mesas. These uh, appear among other places, they appear around red giant stars. Red giant stars have a strong infrared radiation and they also have an outflow of material. So it flows in all direction from the red star as depicted by these green arrows. And because of the intense infrared radiation, the material that's flowing out from the star is excited and excited to such an extent that amazing conditions occur. And the situation is that if you are observing, let's say from down here, there is one part where the material is flowing towards you. So you see something that's blue shifted. And then there is another material which is flowing this way. So this is red shifted. And that results that typically these mazes have a double line structure. So there's a red shifted and a blue, it's a blue shifted and a red shifted line. And the whole thing obviously is then also red shifted by the motion of the star. Now the interesting piece about that is that these stars are variable. They're variable in, they're variable in intensity. 
And that is something that we observe. Um, this is one example for one of these infrared stars. So again, you see the double peak structure here. And this is a plot of the intensity of this maser over a long period of time. So the first part here, the crosses, these were observed by a French radio telescope. And now we have taken over and we continue to observe that, not only this star, but many of these, to see whether they remain in this cycle or whether they deviate in the cycle to see something about the development uh, of these stars. This is a cooperation between ourselves and two universities, uh, the Hamburg University and the Manchester University in the UK, where we have a joint project. And um, this is a long-term project where we observe that for, yeah, for the foreseeable future. So this is a very interesting thing to do, to do this. We do this on a regular basis. I think every six weeks we take spectra and uh, measure the intensity and so on. All right. Um, Famous story, pulsars. Um, you will all know pulsars are neutron stars. They are uh, typically observed in our Milky Way. Um, they are very interesting for a very no large number of reasons, uh, but one of the reasons is they can be variable. They can be variable on very short time scales. Um, the observation method is that they are continuum emitters, but you have to observe them spectrally resolved simply because the, uh, due to the dispersion, you have a delay between the arrival time of the pulsar, which is dependent on the frequency, and you need to compensate for that. And this is called D dispersion. And in order to be able to do that, you need to have the spectral resolution. This graph is something which is called a PP dot diagram. Um, you see lots of black dots there, and each black dot represents a known pulsar. This uh, diagram, the x-axis below here, shows the period of the pulsar. So how fast is this rotating? And the vertical axis shows how fast is it changing the rotation. Pulsars are known to be very, very stable in their rotation rate, but they are not completely stable, they lose energy, so they slowly spin down. And this is the spin down rate that's plotted here. And you can see two distinct populations. There's, so let's say the normal pulsars, they typically have a rotation rate of a few seconds down to maybe 100 milliseconds or so. And then there's another population of the so-called milliseconds pulsars, which rotate much faster um, down to the millisecond range. And you see that many of these have a circle around them. And a circle means these are binaries, they're binary systems. And this is also the reason why most, why they are so fast. They are creating material from their companion and therefore spin up. So this is sort of the zoo of pulsars and the red dots are the ones that we have observed. Um, at the moment, we have a collection of about 130 pulsars, which we were able to observe. Um, Obviously, we started with the strongest one, but then worked our way down to pulsars in the one uh, Miliansky range. And we were lucky to capture, um, where's my cursor? There's my cursor. Um, we were lucky to capture this one here, which is almost the fastest pulsar. It's a 1.5 millisecond pulsar. There's only this one, which is just a little bit faster, but this one is too weak for us to observe. Now, uh, one could talk endlessly about pulsars. Uh, I will refrain from doing that, uh, but just uh, pick up one exotic object, and this is a magnetar. Um, that's in the PP dot diagram, it's here. A magnetar um, is something that is very similar to a pulsar. Uh, go to the next slide to explain that a bit. It's also a neutron star, but as the name already suggests, it has a much stronger magnetic field. A pulsar is already very, very strong in its magnetic field, but these guys are about a factor of a thousand stronger than a normal pulsar. They typically rotate slowly, uh, a couple of seconds, 
And most of them are only visible in the X-ray and gamma ray range. That's just something specific to magnetars that they typically are only visible in X-ray and gamma ray. Now, the one that we have observed is something special. First of all, it's, there are not that many magnetars that are known, about 30. And only few of them um, have ever been observed in the radio regime. And this one is the first one that has been observed. Um, that's a couple of years back um, when it was detected that this uh, magnetar emits radio emissions and it was observed continuously and uh, it was observed that it got weaker and weaker and weaker and sort of disappeared in 2008. Then there was a report uh, on the 8th of December of uh, 2018 when the Jotel Bank um, reported that it has been become bright again. And obviously the first thing we did is, okay, when is the next time that we can go and observe it? And we did that. So this is our first observation of this, of this rebrightened magnetar on December 12th um, in 2018. This is a presto plot that has been explained nicely just in the previous talks. So uh, you're already familiar with that, but we show here the, the pulsar profile. This is the same thing expanded a bit. And what we've been doing ever since is um, to observe this uh, magnetar. Um, we started in 2000, late in 2018 and then when continued into 2019, it got weaker and weaker and weaker and then it sort of disappeared at least for us. And uh, now there are some recent reports um, that it has rebrightened again. Um, we have to go and check. We did some observations the last couple of days, but we were not able to see it yet. So we have to see how that evolves. But uh, that's a nice thing. And it also shows that sometimes um, so all of a sudden new things come up, which you then can investigate. To finalize um, the story of observation projects, I finally want to finish off with talking about something that I would call a very ambitious project with uh, limited um, aspects of success. That's fast radio burst. First of all, what, what are fast radio bursts? These are single events, mostly single events, at least that's a present understanding of a single radio flash. Um, the important or the uh, special thing about these radio flashes is that they have a high dispersion and this high dispersion is so big that it cannot be uh, due to a dispersion within our own Milky Way. So they have to come from far, far away. They are, uh, it's very likely, almost certain that they're of extragalactic origin and um, they're typically one milliseconds or a couple of milliseconds long. Now, if they come from an extragalactic origin, these must be extremely ex intense events. And the um, reason why that occurs is really uncertain at the moment. Um, so far, there are about 120 of these events known uh, from various observations. Um, that's a moving target. Um, there's a website which lists all the observations and um, Rumors are, or it's pretty certain that the CHIME telescope has quite a lot of them which they haven't published yet. So there are quite a number of these. Um, there are endless theories of what, what it might be. Some uh, theories are really crazy, but uh, anyway, one has to find out what are these. Now, in the beginning, um, one was thinking these are one-time events, but on somebody, it was, uh, a lady, uh, Laura Spittler, found that one of these repeaters actually did repeat. So from the same position with the same dispersion measure, there was, were more events. So that's really put things upside down uh, in the question of what might be the origin. And um, now the question is, um, are repeaters something different? Uh, are repeaters the same thing as single events, only that we don't see the repeating? So lots of questions. And the most recent um, thing that became known was that some repeaters show regular activity patterns. So they give a couple of pulses, then they're silent, and then they give another couple of pulses and are silent and give another couple of pulses. And this uh, is a 
regular activity pattern. So this is um, something that is known, I think, um, since the beginning of this year. So what are we doing with all this? Um, first of all, we are hunting for, for repeaters. Um, the first known repeater is this one here. Um, they're actually named after the date when they were first seen. So this was first seen in data from the um, 2nd of November, 2012. And uh, it was detected that it was repeating by Laura Spittler. Um, and we did a joint campaign with Effelsberg on that to observe that. Um, the Effelsberg was observing at a different frequency. And the question was, if they observe something at frequency X, do we observe at frequency Z? And uh, well, the outcome was Effelsberg did see something, we did not see something from that one can conclude certain characteristics and that is published in a scientific paper. Uh, we're also looking at this guy here um, for two reasons, a circumpolar, so anytime uh, we can do it. And um, there are some reports uh, that some of the pulses were strong enough that, so that we could see it with our 25 meter dish if we were lucky enough to look at that place at that point in time. So we are trying to see. Most of the recent observation times goes onto this one. Uh, and because this is um, one of these where you have a regular activity pattern. And um, obviously that gives the highest chances. So we do targeted observations during these activity phases. And as I'm talking, actually, uh, we have an operator, one of our guys sitting at the telescope right now and taking data from this. And then another activity that we have is looking for FRBs, uh, which are unknown. So we do so-called blind searches. That uh, is something that we do when we, when we park the uh, telescope and use it for, not for anything else. The rationale is if um, the FRBs are anywhere, so they can appear at any point in the sky at any time. So it doesn't matter where you're looking. Uh, so you, we can look and collect data while it's parked. The challenge though is that we have lots and lots of data which we need to collect and which we need to evaluate. And I'll explain that chain a bit. So we have our pulsar spectrometer that collects the data uh, at a high uh, rate. So in this case, we use about 200 microsecond resolution. This gives us about three megabyte per second in data rate, and we write this in a common uh, known file. And this is then where our GPO kicks in. The trouble is that if it's a new FRB, you don't know what the dispersion measure might be. And in order to detect that pulse, you need to try out the dispersion measure. And if you go and uh, let's say try out dispersion measure from 100 to 1000 or 1500, this is a lot of, lot of computing which cannot be done on a standard computer. And this is where we use this Heimdall code, which is running on a, a GPU. Uh, only this allows us to really analyze this data. And that creates so-called candidate files, um, which uh, we then have a second program, which is eliminating the things that are obviously radar. And then we do some manual inspection. And sure enough, uh, we haven't found one yet. Uh, we are still collecting data every now and then when we have time and uh, especially have the time to do the analysis. But it's uh, just taking chances and uh, make use just of the time when the telescope is available. All right. Um, Final words, uh, what our main programs that we do, we call it focus programs. We look especially for pulsars, some special effects like giant pulses and mode switching. I mentioned the lunar occultations this is something that we have finished just uh, now and we'll write uh, some things eventually for the Zara journal about it. Then we do something special for the hydroxyl. And then we have our cooperation programs where we uh, work with university, the one which I mentioned, the OH Mesa long-term monitoring. And then we have cooperation on the fast radio burst stuff with the Max Planck Institute and the Toronto University. And besides these programs, we do whatever comes to our mind when we think, okay, let's do this, let's do that. Then we go and do it. My last slide is what's our mission and how do we position ourselves? Um, 
we think we do amateur radio astronomy at a worldwide top level. So we have a big instrument and having a big instrument also puts a obligation on you. You really need to do something with it and you need to do things thoroughly uh, with good scientific background. And this allows then also to do cooperation with scientific institutions. Um, we do quite a number of education programs, both with universities where schools come, uh, where students come to our place and do lab courses. And we also have schools coming to our site and uh, doing some radio astronomy experiments. And I also mentioned the little transportable radio telescope that we bring to schools. We also take efforts to have general outreach activities where we explain to people why are you doing radio astronomy and why do you are doing fundamental research anyway, um, just to get a good understanding to, for people why people are doing science. And last not least, uh, the most important thing for us as being retired or uh, doing this as amateurs is just having lots and lots of fun. Thanks very much and I'm happy to take questions. Great, uh, uh, outstanding brief. Uh, there's a number of questions on the chat. Um, yes. Uh, let's see, from Dennis Farr, what is the beam width of the dish? Um, at, one, uh, at 1420, the beam width is uh, 0.6 degrees. Okay. Um, from John Colt, uh, thank you Wolfgang for an excellent presentation. How broadband are the cross dipoles in the feed horn? Is there a significant difference in sensitivity between the two frequency ranges you use? Is one of the frequencies um, closer to the dipole resonance? Um, I wish I knew. <laughs> um, certainly it's, it's optimized for um, 1400. So I can assume that we have a bit of a loss um, in sensitivity to 1600. Um, it's not that easy to, to measure. We can measure it very nicely on 1400. What is our aperture efficiency and, and stuff like that. Um, because of the lack of calibration possibilities and calibration sources in the sky, um, that's a little bit more difficult um, to do at 1600. Um, so I, I'm afraid I can't answer it quantitatively saying, um, yes, we are probably losing something, but it, it doesn't seem to be too bad. Okay. Um, from Chip Sufici, uh, great presentation. Any plans to use the antenna? to transmit signals for radar observations such as ionosphere, moon, planets, asteroid bouncing? And not the 25. Um, we do have the capability for EME on the 10 meter dish at 10 gigahertz. Um, the reason why we don't do it at the big dish, it's a matter essentially of interest of members, of the membership. Um, we asked the question, we discussed it, uh, but um, nobody really wanted to take it up and um, we also understand ourselves as, as a primarily um, radio astronomy um, institution. Um, we could do other things, but it's a matter of manpower doing additional things. Okay. Uh, from Gary Evans, uh, with a, an assist here from Blair uh, Hearth, um, where can we find the list of coordinates for the known high velocity hydrogen clouds? And Blair uh, answered him partially uh, she says the handbook of star forming regions. Um, uh, and uh, if, if you got another list. Yeah, I think the best source um, is something I would um, look up and I'm happy to send an email or uh, maybe uh, do it in the Drake Lounge tonight. There's a, there's a good paper by a guy named Tobias Westmeyer who has done a lot of investigation on that. Um, the, the hydrogen clouds, they're a bit extended, so the, uh, there's not a very exact uh, single uh, point in the sky. They're somewhat extended, just like hydrogen, but uh, there's things where they are more intense that, uh, than at other places. I think the best way to answer this is by, by sending a link to uh, appropriate documentation. Okay. Um, let's see. Ed Harfman, great presentation. Thank you. Um, Rosemary Walling, uh, how do you measure the magnetic field for a magnetar? I have to skip on that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we don't measure it ourselves. <laughs> and um, that's something I would have to look up myself. I don't know how it's, how it's done. Okay. Um, Dave Fields, uh, thanks Wolfgang. Many good research projects. The magnetar that went below observation threshold in 2008 
than was observed in 2018. Why perhaps did it brighten? Nobody has, to the best of my knowledge, nobody has really come up um, with a theory about it. Um, it's um, most likely not a um, movement of the of the conos um, because uh, it's not completely correlated with a change in the X-ray. Uh, that's that's one of the areas where people are interested in and why they are doing these observations. Uh, a cone motion will certainly play a certain role, but it could also be um, a a change in the magnetic structure on the surface uh, of, of the magnetar, which is a sort of going through cycles. But whether it's cyclic, so it, it occurs every 10 years or so, that's uh, something that's not known yet. So okay. it's really all about collecting more data and then trying to get gradually understand the physics behind it. Okay. From John McCullough, you said your organization is volunteer for the personnel. How many people are in the organization? What is the annual budget for hardware, software, maintenance, and what are the typical funding sources? Yep. Um, our association has formally about 170 members. Then uh, as in every organization like that, you have people who are just members and the ones who are doing the work who are active. The active membership, I would say, depending on where to, where to draw the borderline, somewhere between 10 and 20. Uh, there are people who are more frequently there, people who are less frequently there, but that's, that's the order of magnitude. Um, the financial side is we have, we have the need for an operational budget that is covering uh, energy, um, heating, a couple of other things, that's about 25,000 euros per year. Um, the uh, funds come from various sources. One is the membership dues, which are not that, that much. It's uh, 36 euros per year for uh, membership. It comes from donations. It comes from the university program. So the, uh, the universities pay for the student lab courses. They do not pay for the, for the research side. Uh, but they pay for the lab courses. Also the school projects are financed. And then I should mention that the um, formal owner of the premises, the, this foundation, they take over if there is something with the building. So if something has to be repaired on the building, that's what, what they're uh, taking up. Um, then I think it's worthwhile mentioning that much of the equipment that we have, you've seen there's quite a bit of equipment. Um, these are to a large extent donations from scientific institutions. So for example, all, uh, let's say half of our storage systems, these are come from a, a nuclear research institutes where they were sort of uh, taken out because they were too old. Um, the new spectrometer that um, we are setting up, the ice board that comes from the Toronto University. So we didn't have to pay for that. So a lot of that comes from these corporations where we provide observation time and they do something good for us. All right. Um, Jack Lobinger, excellent presentation, Wolfgang, thank you. Gary Memory, uh, what is the tracking speed? Are you able to track Leo? Um, the tracking speed is um, about half a degree per second, both in azimuth and elevation. That's probably, depending on how, how the Leo transits, um, probably not enough. If it's, uh, let's see, if it's low on the horizon, uh, we can probably track a Leo, but if it's going overhead, more or less overhead, then we can do it. Okay. Um, uh, Ted Klein, uh, tell us about exciting access to the dish focus. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting. <laughs> so people have to climb up um, with appropriate gear uh, to be on the uh, safe. Um, if we want to take the receiver down, and we just did that uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of weeks back, um, we have to attach a winch with a steel cable uh, at the base of the dish and then bring the steel cable up. There is a, 
I call that, well, a, a wheel that then goes on the back of the receiver. We loosen the receiver and then the receiver, it's about 100 kilogram, that receiver is then put down in, into the base of the dish. It doesn't fit anywhere to, uh, through the openings. So then the uh, steel cable is attached to one of the legs, one of the supporting legs, and then the receiver is pulled up there. And then we turn the dish from the bath, bath, uh, bird bath position to 90 degrees to the side, so at low elevation. And then we can bring the receiver down to the ground. That's an exercise of about six hours and six people. And it takes two people to go up uh, in the prime focus and they have to be experienced and careful. Wow. Yeah, our, our 60, uh, 60 footers a little, little bit easier than that sounds like. Yeah, you have this, this um, actually yeah. one can see it at the, on, on your background slide. You have this uh, thing where you can walk up. That's the very tower. convenient. Uh, yeah. But um, we don't have that. We have, we have to be adventurous. That's good. That's good. Um, uh, let's see, Bruce Randall. How do you inject calibration signals? Okay. Um, in the receiver box, I haven't shown that in detail. Um, there is a noise a diode, a, a noise generating diode, and then in the feed horn, there's a small injection pad. I would call it, uh, and we inject the noise there from. And we can turn the uh, noise diode off and on, and also we can change the uh, power of the noise diode, and that's what we use for calibration. Okay, Tom Aslan, thanks, Wolfgang. Uh, Rosemary Walling, have you shared the design for your portable unit you take to schools? We we have not shared it in total. Um, because no, nobody really asked about, ex with the one exception, um, the software that we use for the spectrum analysis is this chain with SOPI SDR and SOPI power and, and things that go with that. Um, that's something that we have uh, provided to other on request. Um, obviously, there is something which is uh, specific to the rotor that we use. There's some hardware that we have built um, which drives the mo uh, this rotor uh, because we don't use the, um, the uh, a controller that's provided by the manufacturer because that was not designed for radio astronomy. So there's, there's something which is bespoke, which we have built in hardware. Um, the, then there is a Raspberry Pi that does the uh, controlling. And of course we have um, the software to, to control it. I should mention that um, we typically uh, use the same or try to use as much software as possible in all our telescopes, the same software. For example, all the coordinate conversion is completely the same for all our telescopes. Uh, it's modular so that we can only exchange or only need to exchange certain parts. Um, so if, if somebody is interested um, in building something similar, um, I'm, I'm happy to share as, as much as we have. All right. Um, I think it's the last question. Uh, Peter East, uh, great presentation, Wolfgang, very interesting. Uh, the magnetar dispersion measure appeared quite low. Yes, it's, it's low. It's also, we, we can, actually, we can measure the, the dispersion measure because it's such a slow and such a wide pulse. Um, so it's, um, the, uh, the dispersion measure is low and uh, we really don't need to de-disperse strictly speaking because it's such a slow uh, rotating thing. That's, that's right, it's, it's low. Okay, and from Raspberry Walling, great talk, thank you. I think that's it for the, uh, the questions. Outstanding talk, Wolfgang. Uh, Thanks. Very, I learned a ton of stuff. Um, okay, so thank you very much.